Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Now the next speaker, Chris Bishop, uh, is going to talk about machine learning. Chris Bishop is a distinguished scientist from Microsoft Research Cambridge Lab in UK. And uh, he heads the machine learning and perception group over there. He's also the vice president of the Royal Institution of Great Britain and professor of computer science at the University of Edinburgh. He's fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of uh, Darwin College of Cambridge. His research interests include machine learning and its applications, neural networks, pattern recognition, and natural language processing and their applications. Request Chris to come and deliver the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Excellent. So I've spent all of my career so far in research, and my plan is to spend the rest of my career in research. And there's just one simple reason for this. If you solve a problem in research, then it stops being research. So as a researcher, you move on to the next problem, which means no matter how long you spend in the field of research, you're always working on new things. It's always fresh. Being a researcher, I think, is tremendous fun. It's exciting to solve difficult problems. It's exciting to see your work have an impact on the lives of millions of people. And I consider it to be one of the greatest privileges in life, actually to be paid to do something you enjoy doing. If you enjoy what you do, you have a happy life. So that's why, for me, research is the best career, even better than a rock star. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research field, which is an area called machine learning. It's been mentioned several times. It's the idea that computers, instead of being programmed to solve a problem, they can learn how to solve the problem by seeing data. They learn from example, they learn from experience. And I, when I first moved into computer science about 20 years ago, the field of machine learning was very small. It was kind of in a corner of the field. But today, it's, it's mushroom. Today, machine learning is one of the hottest and fastest moving areas of computer science. In fact, in Microsoft Research, quite a significant proportion of our research is either research into machine learning or research which builds on and which depends upon machine learning in one way or another. Now, the aspect of machine learning that I want to talk about this afternoon has to do with the problem of dealing with uncertainty. Now, I'm sure you know computers are built not on uncertainty, but on logic. So the hardware engineers who design computers work very, very hard to remove uncertainty. They want everything to be true or false, zero or one. And that's fine if you have a small computer working in isolation. But today, we connect thousands and millions of computers together, and they become a very complex system. We have computers that interact with people. We're always interacting with computers all day long. And people are not zero or one. They're complex. They are full of uncertainty, ambiguity, contradiction. And especially in the field of machine learning, we get computers to learn from vast quantities of data, data collected from all kinds of places. That data is full of uncertainty. It has noise, it had errors, it has gaps, it has contradictions. Let me just give you one example of what I mean. This is Xbox, this is Microsoft's game console, and it's connected to a cloud service called Xbox Live. Now, millions of people use Xbox and Xbox Live to play games against each other. You can go on the Xbox and you can play a game against people from all around the planet. So Xbox Live has to choose which people to match up to play games against each other. 
Now, if you want to have a good game, you want to play against somebody who has a similar skill level to you, so you don't win too easily, you don't lose too easily. So a critical thing that Xbox Live has to do is to make an assessment of the skill of each of the players. And the problem is we don't really know how skillful somebody is, especially if they're a newcomer to Xbox Live. So we're uncertain about a player's skill. But Xbox Live knows the outcomes of games, and of course, if somebody wins against somebody else, they're probably more skillful. Not necessarily, but they're probably more skillful. So as we see the outcome of each game, Xbox Live gets relevant information that helps it improve its estimation of the player's skills. But no matter how many games it sees, it can never be completely certain about a player's skill. So somehow, to solve this problem, we need a way of dealing with uncertainty in a principled way, something equivalent to the logic of traditional computer science, some sort of mathematical framework that allows us to treat uncertainty in a way that is optimal. And it's not just uh, on Xbox. Uncertainty is everywhere in the modern world of computer science. If I want to suggest a movie for you to watch, I may now know something about the movies that you like and don't like, but I can never be certain if you're going to like a particular movie or not. In speech recognition, we can never be completely sure what a person said. If I'm trying to sell you something, I have some idea of the things you like, but I'm not certain if you're going to buy a particular product. These examples are everywhere. So the mathematical foundation that we use to deal with uncertainty is something that's actually very familiar to everybody. It's the idea of probability. You've all come across probability. The weather forecaster says there's a 30% chance that it's going to rain tomorrow. Right. If it's Jaipur, it's probably not 30%. In Cambridge, it's probably 90%. But it's a number that sort of quantifies the degree of uncertainty. So rather than talk about the, the mathematics of probability, what I thought I would do is to show you a little demonstration. So this is a, a toy example, uh, and it's built with a piece of technology called Infra.net that I'll mention a little bit later. But in this example, uh, the system is going to learn about my preferences for movies. Now the system has already undergone some machine learning. It's been shown hundreds of thousands of ratings of movies made by tens of thousands of people. It doesn't know anything about the movies. It doesn't know whether they're romantic comedy or action adventure. It doesn't know anything about the people either. It's just been told that person 53 liked movie number one, didn't like movie number 14. That's the only information it has. So it's analyzed all that data from those thousands of people. And now what it's going to do is to learn about my movie preferences. So I wasn't one of those people. It knows nothing at all about me. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, imagine that I've watched a movie. Let's say I've watched uh, this one, Pretty Woman. And let's say I like this movie. So I'm going to drag this across into the green region. And what it's doing is reordering the other movies according to the probability that it thinks I will like that movie. So. Let me explain what's going on on the screen here. The, the vertical position of the movie on the screen doesn't matter. We've just spread them out so you can see them. What matters is the horizontal position. So a movie which is down the right-hand side is one which the, the computer thinks I'm almost certain to like. If it's down the left-hand side, the computer is very confident that I will dislike that movie. And if the movie is in the middle, it's 50-50. It's really just not sure whether I'll like that movie or not. Now look what we have at the moment. We have all the movies down the middle. We have a lot of white space down the right-hand side, a lot of white space down the left-hand side. So the system at the moment is very unsure. It's very uncertain about which movies I like and which movies I don't like. And that's not surprising because it's only seen one piece of data. I've only rated one movie so far. What I need to do now is to give it a little bit more data. So let's take another movie, and let's say that I don't like this movie. OK, what we see is the movies are starting to, to spread out left and right. The movies are moving towards uh, certainty on the right-hand side that I like them, certainty on the left-hand side uh, that I won't like them. 
So this, if you like, is the, the modern view of machine learning. It's a computer that becomes less uncertain as a result of seeing data. In other words, it's learned something from that data. Now, at the moment, it knows very little about me. There's one movie I like, one movie I don't like. Let's see what happens if I uh, have another movie that I like, another movie that I don't like. Now what you see is a very different uh, pattern. Most of the movies are either down the right-hand side. These are ones it's fairly confident that I'm going to like. These would be good ones to recommend to me to watch. These are ones it's pretty confident um, that I won't like. And, and down the middle, there's a lot of white space. So the white space is in the middle now. It's much less uncertain as a result of seeing data. It's not completely certain. No movie is exactly at the right or the left. So there's always a bit of uncertainty. And there are one or two movies in the middle. It's really just not sure. I'm just briefly going to show you one more thing about this demo. Because Jeanette mentioned information. And information is such a key concept. I'm just going to take a moment to show you something neat using this demo to illustrate um, what we mean by information. The field of information was invented by a, 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 a researcher called Claude Shannon, and he defined information as the degree of surprise. So let's see why that is. Uh, let's take a movie down the right-hand side. So a movie down the right-hand side is one that the system is very confident that I will like. So let's take one of these movies, and let's suppose I watch the movie, and yes, indeed, I do like this movie. So watch what happens when I let go of the mouse button. Watch very carefully to the other movies. Here we go. Perhaps you didn't see that. Let me take another one. Here's another one that I like. Watch what happens when I let go. Did you see that? Just very, very little change. That's because the, the system was confident that I would like the movie. So when I told it that I did like the movie, there was very little surprise. Let's take another one that it's confident that I'm going to like. And let's suppose I watch this movie. And actually, you know, I don't like this movie. So I'll drag this over here. Watch carefully what happens now when I let go of the mouse button. OK, here we go. OK, a very big change. It was confident I would like the movie, but I didn't like the movie. So there's a huge degree of surprise. In other words, there's a lot of information. Now, in each case, I'm just giving it one bit of data. I either like the movie or I don't. So the amount of data is the same in each case, but the amount of information is very different. On the right-hand side, the amount of information is zero, and it actually goes to infinity uh, logarithmically as you go across to the right-hand side. So that's the difference between data and information. OK, so that's a, um, a, a very simple demonstration of the idea of probabilities and the idea of learning from data. Now, this was just a, a toy demonstration that was written for the purposes of giving uh, talks. But actually, the exact same technology, the same software, uh, which powers this demonstration is in use on Xbox for the purposes of making recommendations. So recommendations of uh, which games you should buy and uh, which movies you should watch and so on are made using this exact same technology. Uh, we call it collaborative filtering. It's looking at patterns of likes and dislikes from other people and using that to, to make predictions about things that you will like. And so this is making tens of millions of, of predictions uh, for Xbox Live users every day. So I want to talk a little bit more then about this, this mushrooming field of machine learning. It's been around for many decades. Many people have worked in the field. And so over the years, many different techniques or many different algorithms have been developed. And they have all sorts of fancy names, and you can see lots of them here. So it's quite a big and complex field. The thing that I'm interested in is, in a sense, a new approach to machine learning, or at least a, a new way of viewing many of those uh, traditional algorithms. I call it probabilistic modeling. So the goal of probabilistic modeling is actually very ambitious. Imagine the following. Imagine we just had a single environment within which we could create a bespoke solution, a special solution for each and every new application that we need to build. And imagine that could be done with very little effort, and the result was a very efficient and effective algorithm. So in the past, to solve a problem with machine learning, we've taken our data, we've taken our problem, and we've looked at all of those algorithms that people have invented, and we've tried to find one that looks like a good fit for our problem, and we've used that to solve our, our application. 
And many times that works. And there are many, many successful applications of machine learning, thousands of them already in Microsoft products, in virtually every Microsoft product, in fact. But what we're trying to do is something a little bit different. What we're trying to do here is uh, what we call a model-based approach. In other words, you start from the problem and you design a specific solution. That specific solution might happen to be one of the methods that you saw on the previous view graph, or it might be slightly different. But it's tuned to the specific problem that you're trying to solve. Now, I should say that this is really an aspiration. This is very much at the research frontier, and we don't yet have all the answers in place to be able to do this, but we have made some very interesting progress, as you'll see. So the way we're approaching achieving that uh, vision is uh, using three key ideas. So the first one you've seen already, the idea that we're going to use probability as a way of measuring uncertainty, and you saw that in the movie recommender demo. The second idea is a rather nice one. It appeals to me a lot. It's the idea of using pictures instead of doing mathematics. Well, it's not exactly instead of doing mathematics. It's really to help us deal with very complex mathematics. So instead of doing the mathematics by hand, we draw these pictures, these graphs. And these graphs help us to visualize the model that we're constructing, the solution that we're creating to some new application. And then the third thing we need, we need this to be very efficient. We want to apply this to large data sets, millions or billions of data points. We need it to be very efficient. And we need clever and efficient algorithms that can actually do the machine learning. We call this an inference problem. And so having those algorithms, those efficient algorithms, is, is essential if we're to achieve this vision. So to see how this works, I want to go back to the example I started with, the problem of Xbox and Xbox Live, and how is Xbox Live going to estimate the skills of the people playing on that uh, cloud service? So the problem of estimating the skills of people playing games against each other, of course, is a very old one. It's been around for a very long time. And if you consider a game like chess, in a game like chess, one person plays against another person, and we want to use the outcome of all of those pairs of games to work out the skills of everybody involved in the chess tournament. This problem was actually addressed by a physicist named Elo, and he came up with a, a proposed solution to this problem. And Elo is very popular. Elo is used worldwide uh, in the game of chess. Anybody who plays chess has an Elo chess rating, and it's used in many other games as well. Now, Elo seems to work, but there are various problems. One of the problems is that it's fine for two people, but if we have a game involving many people, then Elo simply doesn't apply. And obviously, that's no good for Xbox, because on Xbox, we might have four players, eight players playing in the same game. Another limitation of ELO is that it doesn't address the problem of team games. Imagine we have four people in a team over here playing against four people in a team over here. Let's say this team is the winner. We think that this team is therefore more skillful than this team, but how do I change my estimates of the skills of the individual players. It's called a credit assignment problem. How do I know which members of that team really contributed to the victory? Again, ELO doesn't address this. So at Microsoft Research, we've developed a probabilistic machine learning solution to this problem, which is called TrueSkill. TrueSkill overcomes those limitations of ELO, but it does something else which is even more dramatic, and I'll show you that in a moment. So, how does this work? How are we going to solve the problem of estimating skills in these online computer games? Well, we're going to draw a little picture of our solution. We're going to use one of these graphs. So, the first thing we need is to uh, imagine our situation. Let's start with the simplest case of two players playing against each other. We'll call them player one and player two. And we'll start with a, a variable. I've called it S1. It's the skill of player one. We'll represent that by that little piece of graph. Now, that represents what we call a probability distribution. It's a probability that expresses our uncertainty in the person's skill. Now, skill, of course, is a, a continuous... Skill is a continuous quantity. 
You can be a little bit skillful, very skillful, extremely skillful. And so this is really, this is the probability of different values of skill. And this little shape, we call this a Gaussian distribution. People in my field are very fond of these. We use these all over the place. It's a little bell-shaped curve which says the most probable value of skill is in the middle here, but it could be a bit higher, it could be a bit lower, but it's unlikely to be very high or very low. It represents uncertainty, rather like the uncertainty in whether I'm going to like a movie or not. So that's the skill of player one. I would, that's the thing I want to know, and I don't know it has some uncertainty. We'll do the same thing for our second player. Here's the Gaussian distribution for, our, for the skill of the second player. You'll notice that this, in this case, the, the distribution is narrower. There's less uncertainty in the person's skill. This perhaps is somebody who's played a lot more games, we've seen a lot more data, and therefore the true skill system is less uncertain about their skill. The next problem we have to face is the following. If two people play a game against each other, the more skillful one is more likely to be the winner, but sometimes the less skillful person can beat the more skillful person. It's a noisy problem. And so we model that effect by bringing in another quantity, pi, pi 1. We call this the performance of person 1 on this particular game. And that, if you like, is rather like their skill value, but with a bit of extra uncertainty added reflecting the fact that sometimes a person plays a bit better than their average skill and sometimes a little bit worse. We do the same thing for player two. And then finally, we simply say the winner is the person with the higher performance value. So most of the time, it'll be the person with the higher skill, but sometimes it'll be the person with the lower skill. And then finally, another little piece of uh, 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 pictorial notation when we actually measure a quantity, we shade in the, the node on the graph. So this quantity is the game outcome. It might be 1 if player 1 is the winner and 0 if player 2 is the winner. So the thing we measure is the outcome of the game. The thing we want to know are the skill values. We want to use the data to improve those estimates of skills, to modify the uncertainty, just like we did with the movie example. And it turns out that there's a very elegant solution to this problem. Remember I said, we need an algorithm that's going to be very efficient, that's going to scale to millions of variables. Well, it turns out that the algorithms which are efficient are ones which can be expressed very simply as passing little messages around on the graph. So the actual computation that we do is equivalent to the nodes, the circles on these graphs, sending little messages to each other. So these little messages are, are sent around the graph in a way that's very efficient. And when we finish sending these messages, we can now compute the revised skill distributions. So if you look at the uh, at player two, look what happens when we update their skill distribution. You'll see, uh, in this case, player two was the winner. So this distribution shifts to the right. The system is increasing the, the, the average value of the estimate of their skill. The other thing that happens is it becomes narrower. There's a little bit less uncertainty because the system has seen some more data. Just like with the movie recommender, when I recommend a movie, the movies move towards left and right, there is less uncertainty. In this case, the distribution gets narrower, meaning there's less variability, there's less uncertainty. So player two was the winner, so player one must have been the loser, so let's see what happens to player one. Well, that distribution shifts down a little bit because they were the loser, and so the average of their, their skill estimate is reduced a little bit. Also, that distribution again gets a little bit narrower. The system has seen some more data, it's learned from the data, it's become less uncertain, and so the spread in that distribution is a little bit less. So let's look at some actual results. And, you know, one of the things we do in research is not enough just to come up with an idea and then get it working. We often do comparisons. We want to know, is this technique better or worse than some other technique? Perhaps it's better in some respects, perhaps not so good in other respects. Well, the obvious comparison to make here is between the true skill algorithm, the true skill probabilistic model that I've just described, and that ELO system, the system that's used in chess and in many other games. So this is some data taken from an Xbox game called Halo, 
And this data actually involves thousands of players. But what we're going to do is just plot the results for just two of these players. So these are their sort of user aliases. And on the axis here, this is the number of games they've played. So notice this is 100 games, 200 games, 300 games, and so on. And this is the estimate of the skill values of those two players. And in this case, everybody starts off with a skill of zero. So under ELO, you see what happens. Every time a game is played, there's a little formula in ELO which updates the skill value. So the skill values are increasing, and you can sort of see they're starting to curl over, and eventually they'll flatten off. If we take exactly the same data and we process it using the true skill system, what we see is this. We see dramatically better convergence. The convergence is um, uh, somewhere between a factor of 10 and a factor of 100 faster. I'm not talking about compute time, although the compute time is actually, it's maybe half the speed of ELO. It's certainly very fast. What I'm talking about here is how many games do you have to see in order to have a good estimate of the, of the skill value. So you see, after about 100 games, ELO is still changing its mind, increasing the skill value in tiny steps. True skill is getting a very fast estimate just after a handful of games. This is really important on Xbox Live because we need our users to be playing against people of a similar skill strength so that they have a really good gaming experience. If you have to play hundreds of games before you start to be matched against the right sort of people, you could get fed up and give up playing on Xbox, and that would be a very bad thing. So instead, we can get a good estimate of your skill value just after a few games. Now, I think I have just enough time just to try and explain why this is. Why is it that by using uncertainty, we get a dramatic improvement compared to the ELO system, which doesn't take account of uncertainty? So let me try and give you some intuition for this. Let's suppose that you and I are going to play a game of chess. Let's consider ELO first of all. In ELO, um, I might have um, a, a skill rating of, let's say, 120. You might be 100. So ELO thinks I'm the stronger player. Now let's suppose we play a game of chess. But let's suppose that you're the winner. Sometimes happens that the lower rated player is the winner. Well, in ELO, there's a little formula that takes my 120 and reduces a little bit, takes your 100 and increases a little bit. And that's all ELO can do, because it doesn't have any more information to go on. Now imagine that we analyze the same situation using true skill, which takes account of uncertainty. So let's say that my skill is 120 plus or minus 1. What that means is the average is the same as in the ELO case, but now the system has some uncertainty. And in this case, the uncertainty is very small. Perhaps I've played lots and lots and lots of games. The system has lots of data about me. It has very little uncertainty in my skill value. So I'm 120 plus or minus 1. Now imagine that you're a beginner. You've only played a few games. So your skill value under true skill is 100 plus or minus 30. The same mean value, 100, but a, a, a much bigger spread, much more uncertainty. What does true skill do? Well, true skill makes only a very small change to my skill level. It goes down a tiny bit, and it gets a tiny bit narrower still. But you've just beaten me. And intuitively, if my skill value is 130, sorry, 120 plus or minus 1, and you've just beaten me, your skill value must be 119 or thereabouts. So true skill will automatically make a very big correction to your skill value, move it up to something more like 119 in a single step. And it can do that just using one out one game outcome because it has a measure of uncertainty. So the data is the same, but in, in, if we have the uncertainty, we can extract much more information from that data, and therefore the system can make much bigger changes. And the other key point to notice here, I think this is tremendously important, is why I used the word principled when I talked about using probabilities to quantify uncertainty. You could imagine hacking something together. You could imagine saying, well, if I'm 120 plus or minus 1, we'll make yours 119. You could imagine sort of coding up your intuition like that. If you do that kind of thing, it might work and it might not work. But you're sort of at sea without a compass. And if it doesn't work, you don't know how to fix it. So we don't call. Instead, we use the rules of probability 
to express everything as a probabilistic model. And when we run the rules of probability, when we run these inference algorithms, these message passing algorithms, they do the right thing automatically. So if it's appropriate that your skill value increase by a big amount, that's what will happen. And if that shouldn't happen, then it won't. So the algorithm just does the right thing. That's the advantage of having a, a mathematical foundation for when you're creating algorithms and solving problems. So the last topic I want to talk about is really at the cutting edge of research. It's a field called probabilistic programming. And it's something which really has only been around for the last couple of years, but it's been growing in popularity. And it's a way of achieving that vision that I painted, that vision of being able to create a solution to any machine learning problem very quickly and be able to create a solution that's precisely tuned to that particular application. So we call this probabilistic programming. So what is this? Well, let's think about how we would go about um, coding up true skill. If I sent you off to code up true skill, what would you do? Well, you might do something like the following. You might take a, a programming language, let's say C Sharp or some other programming language, and you would write out the, the whole true skill algorithm, all those inferences, all those message passing algorithms. You'd code them all up in C Sharp. It would take you, well, first of all, you'd have to derive all the equations by hand on a sheet of paper. That would take you, you know, a week or two, and you might make some mistakes. Then you'd have to code them all up. That would be thousands of lines of code. Would take you some more weeks, and you'd make some more mistakes. But eventually, you'd end up with your code. You run it through a compiler to produce machine code. That combines with the data, with the game outcomes in the case of true skill, and the output will be probability distributions, distributions over the skills of the different players. But imagine we could do the following. I've just explained to you, roughly, the true skill algorithm by drawing a little picture. Okay? I was able to explain it to you in a very simple way by just, by just drawing a little diagram. Imagine if we could explain that to the computer. If we could take a picture, or more likely, a, a very short piece of code, which doesn't talk about inference and message passing. It simply talks about player one and player two, and the Gaussian uncertainty in their skills, and their performances, and who was the winner. Very, very simple piece of code. We call that a probabilistic program. So the idea is to have a very compact description of the model, and then to use a very clever piece of software called a probabilistic programming compiler, which will take that model and automatically generate the thousands of lines of C-sharp code or whatever it may be that represents a, a coding up of, of true skill. So that's the vision. We have by no means achieved this vision. This is very much at the research frontier. Um, I was listening to an excellent talk earlier this week by one of the researchers in MSR India who's made some very exciting advances towards achieving this vision. But we are by no means there. It may take a number of years before we really achieve this. And perhaps by then, well, we can recruit the help of some of you to tackle some of these very difficult but very exciting problems. Uh, we have uh, various technologies. I'll mention one of them, Info.net in, in MSR. Uh, there are other tools as well that are trying to achieve this goal of probabilistic programming. We've made some very exciting steps forward. We're certainly not all the way there yet. So let me illustrate probabilistic programming by going back to our example of true skill. This is the graph that you saw earlier, which represents two people playing a game against each other. How would we represent this as a probabilistic program? Well, this is what it looks like in info.net. So it's extremely compact. We've got some, some declarations at the top. And then, essentially, each line of code represents one piece of this graph. So this line of code says that the skill of player one is a Gaussian. That's this piece of graph. This line says the performance of player one is a Gaussian, another Gaussian. And the center of that Gaussian is equal to the skill of player one. So that just says that there's another variable, and it's connected by a line in the graph to the first variable, and so on. So we can take that graph, and we can translate it into a few lines of code. So that's very exciting. But what's really exciting about probabilistic programming is that when you want to change something, you can do it very quickly. You know, in, in machine learning, we would like to be so clever that we could just 
solve the problem directly. And that very rarely happens. What usually happens is we have to try out lots and lots of different things and compare them. We do that all the time in machine learning. So it would be great if we could very con quickly construct lots of different solutions so we could compare them quickly and so we could take a good solution and tweak it to make it a little bit better. So let's see how that might work. So let's look at one of the problems I mentioned that ELO doesn't address. Remember, ELO only works for two players. What if eight of us want to get together and have a, a game on Xbox? Well, it's actually very easy. We draw the graph. This is the case of three players playing a game against each other. Here are the three players. Here are their performances, how well they did on this particular game. And these are the game outcomes. Perhaps player two beat player one, player three beat player two. What does the probabilistic program look like? Well, it's very similar to the previous program. The, the lines highlighted in yellow, though, those are the pieces of code that are different from the first case. So those are the changes that we have to make to implement this case. Here's another problem that ELO doesn't address. Teams. What happens if we have teams? So here's a simple example. There are two teams. The first team involves two players, players one and two. And the second team, uh, as it happens, also involves two players, players three and four. The performance of team one depends upon the skills of the two players. So in the simplest case, it would just be the skill of player one plus the skill of player two. Um, if it's a race and it's first past the finishing line, it would be the max of the skill of player one and the skill of player two, and so on. And then the two teams play the game, and this is the game outcome. Maybe team two is the winner. And by sending messages around the graph, we can update the individual skills of these players, not just, the, not just the skills of the team as a whole. And again, that can be expressed as a probabilistic program. So again, the lines highlighted in yellow are those items which are different from the simple two-player case. Again, a very simple change, very simple to change the code and then recompile. The actual inference code itself is, is very different. It's much more complex in this case. The probabilistic program is very simple. And then finally, Everything I've said so far assumes that the skills of the players are fixed. So when those distributions moved, the skill of the player was fixed. What was changing was the uncertainty that the computer had or the true skill has about the value of that skill. But that's too simplistic. If, you've, if you're new to Xbox or you start playing a game, you won't be very good to start with probably because you haven't got much experience. As you play games, True skill is estimating your skill value with greater and greater precision, but your skill value is changing because you're probably getting better because um, you're gaining experience. Or perhaps you don't play for a few months and your skill goes down again. How can we model that? Well, again, here's the graph. This is two people playing a game against each other, and this is the game outcome. A little bit later, the same two people get together and they play another game. Previously, we would have assumed that the skill of player one on the new game was the same as the skill of player one on the old game. This time, we introduce another of these Gaussians. We just introduce a little bit of uncertainty. It's all we need to do, allow for the possibility that the skill of the player itself might evolve through time. And again, this is the change to the code that we need in order to implement that. Now, of course, there are some extra lines of code to read in the data and write out the answer and so on. That's very straightforward. But the code I'm showing you is real code that actually compiles. And this is the actual code that you would use in Info.net to implement these models. And finally, what I've been describing, this true skill is not just an idea. It's actually a system. It's been used uh, on Xbox Live now for, for many years. It is the only supported system on Xbox Live for estimating the skills of players. Xbox Live currently has 48 million users and continues to grow. And every day, TrueSkill processes the outcome of millions of game outcomes, millions of games results from millions of players. So this is a real system that's in actual use. And I think it's just a very nice example of going all the way from beautiful mathematics to efficient algorithms to real-world impact on millions of people. And with that, let me say thank you very much. <laughs>